Inside Tallgrass Tap House, it's the KSO Show, presented by People's State Bank and Legacy Insurance. It's the first time I've ever said those words. Why, Dale? Why did I say that? It's exciting. I'm glad you bring it up. I won't, I won't make people listen to it for too much. But we'll talk about these guys a lot going forward. We do have a new title sponsor. Uh, sincerely appreciate the time we spent with them the last week or so talking about. Yeah, People's State Bank, Legacy Insurance. I'll have lots of info to share in the coming weeks about where their branches are located. Appreciate their time. But uh, Tallgrass Tap House is still with us, too, so it's not yep. like they've gone yep. away. But exciting stuff for us personally. I think you'll uh, be happy to learn about them more as we go forward. But now, let's talk sports. It's time to preview the Nichols K-State game. First game of the climate era 2019 season. Mason Both is in the house in Tallgrass Oh, yeah, he is. This. this is exciting. You know, just us three. And it's never been us just three. And before. the spirit of Dana Dimmel, as I've established oh, yeah. you explain, guys. Go ahead and can you explain the whole story? <laughs> Please do. Of La- why last this is? year, I went into a, the Goodwill in Manhattan. I bought a pretty sweet Nike pullover. It's very nice. Very new. Looked like it had barely been worn. And it was a little too big. It was a double X. But I said, uh, I'll put up with it. It looks sweet. <laughs> Only $5. I get home. A couple weeks later, I'm getting ready to put it on. And I notice there's a little label on the collar in the back. And I look at it and it says DD. And I go, Holy crap! I think I might have Dana Dimmel's pullover, <laughs> and yep. I mean, there's just everything adds up. It it's all a double adds X. Up. The DD, I think, is Dana Dimmel's, so he's here in spirit. He's he was kind enough, most likely, to get do some nice donations as he left Manhattan and that kind of stuff. And you were, I'm sure, he had you in mind. Yeah, you know, I just gave his thing. family a tax write off. So <laughs> exactly. shout out but to them. I, yeah, I think it's impressive, Dana Dimmel leaves K-State, and he makes sure to go to Goodwill and, and get yeah. his clothes away. Left too. it yeah. in a better place. He just, <laughs> you gotta leave a place better than you found it. That's what I always say. <laughs> yeah, average age of this pod. So you're 24. Flando, yep. you're yep. 21. Yeah. So 45. I'm 37. So that's 77 plus 5 is 82. Is that right? 82 divided yep. by 3. You know, 27 would be about right. So average age, 27. Yeah. Um, right good around. for me. Good right for around me. like D.Y. Kurt's age. And if they were here. Uh, well, Kurt's no, is 30. Those guys are both 30, aren't <laughs> that they? That's true. Yeah, let's not. Don't group. <laughs> they're more in my group than your guys' group. That's and don't true. let them tell you otherwise. <laughs> don't let them convince you they're young. They are like me. They're not like you. Kurtz is probably in bed already. Probably. Yeah. You're probably right. I mean, he's not here yeah. helping us out. No, I'm just yeah. kidding. Kurtzy, we miss you, baby. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just a little. Yeah. Yeah, but let's talk some football. Let's let's first in this first segment we'll have three segments. In this first one, I do want to start by going just position by position yeah. and go back and forth between both of you guys. And I do want to start with you, Dale. Good. Uh, with the the position that I mean, everyone wants to talk about QB yeah. and tell me about. I mean, Skylar Thompson's starting, but you right. still have that battle in the uh, number two spot. You're exactly right. I mean, we get you know so many media availabilities now. Monday, Big 12 conference call. Tuesday, Kleiman presser and players. Wednesday, assistant coaches and players. Thursday, coordinators and players. As we're thinking about how to do this pod, we're like, let's just go spot by spot, say what we've learned because yeah. we've had so many chances. And like you said, quarterback Skylar Thompson is going to start. Uh, I think he's more comfortable than he's ever been. The amount of faith that Chris Kleiman and Courtney Messingham and that staff have in him is, is very real. But the backup thing is kind of the story because we don't we don't really we don't know. I mean, I asked Messingham on Thursday, and he said he still didn't know. It'd be kind of dependent on the game situation. Mason, I don't know what your gut's been telling you. My gut tells me that I think Nick Ost is the number two quarterback. Maybe there's a scenario, and I'm not, I don't even want to talk about like long-term injuries, but if we, but if the job was going to be open for nine weeks, maybe then it becomes John Holcomb or something like that. But I think the backup is Nick Ost. I think it's Nick Ost as well. I think that's just because it's not a, ma- a matter of who can make the splash plays. It's about who could be smart enough to keep them in a game in a situation where it's close. And Nick Ost, I don't think, is going to make as many mistakes just because He's got a little bit more experience, and I think we've heard so much about how much learning Jonathan Holcomb still has to do. But I do foresee a situation where on Saturday, if Skyler gets hurt and you need a big play, and you're in that kind of situation, Holcomb goes in. Or also, if K-State has a lead big enough to where they can throw in the backups, I could see that being somewhere where they say, you know what, we're going to send Holcomb out there first just because he's the most intriguing guy they have. Maybe just go to Mason every time. <laughs> that was really what well, that echoed my thoughts better than I could have said of myself. So just go to Mason. Very well thought out. Yeah, I mean, this position's a little funny. Going into the season, it was like, uh, who, who's going to play here? There's only like one guy on the roster. But now it looks <laughs> 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 It wasn't much of a question. I'm like, well, I guess it's Harry Trotter. You know? like, yeah. But now, yeah, the running back position, you do have a couple of guys in James Gilbert, Jordan Brown, Harry Trotter's an option too. T- take me through that position, Mason, and what I, you think there. Running back is interesting to me because I think we know that there's going to be split carries and everything. 
But if you had asked a lot of people, they probably would have said they would want Jordan Brown to be the guy that I started. Yeah. But that's just because he's got the ACC pedigree and he played at North Carolina at such a young age. Mm-hmm. But I think that James Gilbert coming in and seemingly being the guy proves that he's got a lot to give to K-State and he's got the talent to be here. And then the Harry Trotter stuff's been really interesting yeah. because it went from thinking he was going to have to play no matter what to and he's probably on the back burner now, but he's carved a niche for himself and made himself a guy that the coaches really like and feel like they need to get on the field at times. So I think it's going to be interesting. It'll probably be a situation where it'll just be hot hand or, you know, I don't know, game situation based on who's in there. But I think that K-State is in a good spot at running back right now just because they feel pretty confident in what they got. I mean, you see two guys, James Gilbert, Jordan Brown. I mean, the thought is James Gilbert's going to be the, the starting, starting guy. Right. But, I mean, in a goal line situation, who are you going with, Dale? I got to say first, uh, yeah. straight straight, straight man, no gimmick Mason, is, like, really, really good at talking football. I swear, so when he comes the, on the KSO I'm so show, used he's... to the game, oh. Mason. Where you, everyone plays a role in life, you know? I mean, that kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm sitting here kind of like, man, this is really good. Um, Woo-wee! I, I think if they Every had... Thursday a, at 6.30, Mason, you're here. <laughs> if, I, if they had a situation where they had to, you know, pound the ball in, I still think Gilbert or Brown... Um, they're very similar in body yeah. types. You know what I mean? A guy, I don't think, I don't think this would be him on the goal line. But the guy I'd be most interested in might be, might be Joe Irvin. Yeah. Like, that guy is compact mm-hmm. and thick um, at a different level. And that's all I would add to Mason is he nailed exactly what's going to happen. You're going to see all three of those guys. Probably, I, I think you know if you're going to d- divvy it up, probably Gilbert the most, Brown the next most, Trotter the next most, but probably similar between yeah. all three. Maybe Trotter's a little less than the other two. But the only one that may play that you didn't mention would be true freshman Joe Irvin. But I'd be not surprised if he played, but I don't think it's a guarantee. I think K-State yeah. would like to play him Saturday, and I'd like to see him play. And I, but I don't know that it's – those three are going to play, like he said. I don't know if Joe Irvin will. Yeah, which Kleiman did say earlier in the week that he hopes to play. He pointed out three guys. Right. Joe Irvin was one of them, correct? correct. Joshua Youngblood. And then we uh, the next Another position we talk oh, about – Oh, segue. Josh Denee or <laughs> Josh Denee Jack Denee what a so. less fun name than Jack Denee too thank goodness that's, that's Jack I know, you know? Jax man I mean talk about the fullback tight end position because it's going to be a very interesting in this Messingham it, offense it is it's the thing we've talked about a lot whether it's on you know Kurtz and Mason Show on the game or on our show is we hear all these coaches say things about rotations and playing and and I, it's not that we don't believe them, but until you see it, you really, at least I, I shouldn't speak for you guys, I'm still skeptical. Like, well, I see all these different linemen play on both sides of the ball, these different guys. And then Jax Deneen, like, I, I, they say they'll play him, yeah. so I should just believe him. But I'm, curi- I'm curious, you know. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a necessity. You know, fullback tight end have become kind of one and the same. Nick Linners, who I see, we all see more as a tight end, will, should start at fullback. Blaze Gammon at tight end. They'll both play both spots, so, but... I mean, Jackson Dean's probably going to have to be used. There's still injury issues. I, I, I don't know how serious they are, but Mason Barta battled injury mm-hmm. at times throughout camp. So I don't know how available he necessarily is. So I think I think we're going to see uh, a lot of a lot of Nick Linners and Adam Harder. Yeah. Excuse me, Nick, not Adam Harder, not for the season. Nick Linners and Blaze Gammon. Maybe even Sammy Wheeler is the kind of the third guy in that group before you get to a Jackson Dean or a Mason Barta. But we're going to see a lot of guys playing in those spots. I think, I think fullback's really interesting to me because – this is another one of those positions that going into the season and not knowing everything, but just seeing where the roster is at, Jackson Deneen's a guy that people would have thought, man, they just need to find a way to get him in there to where mm-hmm. he can play. Right. But now, based off the philosophy we've been hearing, they're going to cycle all these guys that are tied in slash fullback yeah. in there and see what happens. I think if Jackson Deneen gets in the game, it would be later on. It's not going to be something where they don't come off as confident in playing him now or feeling like he's worked his way to that. And going to the goal line carry thing, mm-hmm. maybe one of these big guys, if yeah. you feel confident enough that they can hang on to the ball, just he, let them try and plow through somebody. Blaze Gammon is an interesting one. Kellis Robinette was on the game with us today, and he was talking about him even maybe seeing some time at fullback. Yeah. And if, you know, at the know. one yard line, you hand it to a guy that would just has, has to his fall size. down. <laughs> it's I a mean, big guy. That, that would be something to see. And that would be, you know, in honor of Dana Dimmel, that's uh-huh. when you get the ball to the fullback. I'll tell you, and, and, and you mentioned, you know, the Jackson Dean stuff you talked about. And I know high school football and college are very different. Mm-hmm. But he carried the ball a lot for Lawrence Free State. I yeah. mean, and it was a very physical runner. So I don't think that's going to be his role at K-State. But it's not impossible to think that he could be a guy they want to use at the goal line. And I'm going to stick in like a totally unrelated plug that we didn't even really mention. But uh, we were in Papillion, Nebraska oh, I was going to bring night. it up oh, anyway and ask oh, you about it, but I'm happy you did oh. anyway. Well, all I wanted to say was, like, this is going to sound like me gushing, yeah. and it probably is. 
Um, but if you were going to build a, a fullback, H-back, tight end, you know, that case it would Absolutely. want, it'd be Will Swanson. Mm -hmm. Not that he's the – I'm not saying he's a five-star elite athlete or that he won't have room to grow. Yep. He absolutely will. He's not, you know, going to be this instant impact guy. But to see somebody with his frame, you know, a legit 6'5", yes. 240, and he is already thick, he, he could be – he could play at 260, mm -hmm. I think, at K-State. He's a great athlete. He has huge hands. But the thing that's – I say he's the best fit is that kid, you saw it all too, yep. had one ball thrown at him last night. Um, as a, the best which player on, on the, which he caught yep. and almost scored on, yeah, as the best player on his team, and not once did you get a hint, even when they're down 7 3 at halftime, of him being frustrated that he's not getting yeah. the ball. He blocked all night long through the whistle on every play. Every player on the other team hated him by the end of the game because he would not stop blocking them. I just think to get a guy with that frame who's that willing to block, the attitude he showed us after the game and talking to us, man, that's, that's what you would drop on paper to be a K State yeah. H back, fullback, tight end. We should think of a name for that trio position. <laughs> Hey, but later, later. Hey, hey, go look at uh, or listen to DY's yeah. interview with him on uh, our YouTube channel if you want to hear his thoughts. He, I mean, yeah, he basically lays it out. He he thinks he's a perfect fit, and he truly is. I mean, with how he spoke about how he would play both fullback and tight end, he can catch the ball, and like you said, he's a very selfless guy, and it's not about him. He'll block all day long, all day long, if he needs to. Um, I've also never seen a kid get triple teamed on a pass route until last night. Was, I had never cool. seen so many bracket. It was like basketball, Mason. It was like they played triangle and two on pass routes against Will Swanson, <laughs> and I mean it worked for him. But I'd never, I'd never seen it. Yeah, I, it, that that was interesting too because he was open a few times before that. They didn't yeah. even pass it to him, but that's another story. Wide receiver. It's a fun one to talk about. I think Mason. I mean, you got some guys that. I think obviously Dalton Schoen is as he's been around, he's he's the number one guy right now, but that that's a position that could shuffle around throughout the season. Wide receiver is you know, with all these other positions that have had question marks, wide receiver has a lot of people there and I think you feel confident that they just have enough guys that they seem to like. But wide receiver's probably the biggest question mark without being an actual question mark because Dalton Schoen and Wyking Gill going into the fall yep. seemed like givens. And then all of a sudden, we're not hearing as much about White King Gill. That slows down, and it shifts to three, four other guys behind that. But then the depth chart comes out, and it's different. I think it's going to be really interesting, one, to see how much they're used because we know, we know there's going to be a lot more under center work for Skylar Thompson this year. So that's going to be interesting. And then just seeing how they work different guys into the game. Everybody's going to want to see Malik Knowles and Sebastian Taylor. I think it's not a matter of how many times they're used. It's the situations they're used. And if they can make their moves there, then maybe they'll get a little bit more of that playing time. Yeah, and I'm not trying to make a, a mountain out of a molehill, which I've never used that term, but I'm excited <laughs> to do it right now. But what Mason said, it, does, it doesn't all add up. Meaning the staff, if, if we've talked about, I mean, let's list them off. Dalton Schoen, Wyking Gill, Malik Knowles, Chabaston Taylor. Uh, I'm not doing this in any order, but Landry Weber, Joshua Youngblood. Yep. Um, I feel like there's names that I'm missing that we've talked that are on the depth chart right um, did now. Did you say Sebastian? You said I did. But, but, so Seth Porter. Uh, I think there's a name or two I'm missing. The point is, we ask them on like Thursday, how many guys are going to play at receiver? They say five or six. Yeah. But Sebastian Taylor and Joshua Youngblood are not on the depth chart. Yep. So I mean, mm -hmm. not, not that that means anything, but in theory, they're the sixth and seventh receivers. So it doesn't jive, right? You can't only play five receivers, yeah. but also have receivers six and seven getting snaps in that game. So I'm not trying to be critical of it, but I, I'm with Mason. I think if there's a position I'm worried about, it's receiver. You know, some of, the, some of the talk I heard out of camp wasn't all positive about how that group was playing yeah. throughout the camp, and that's why some names have popped up and down. There, like he said, there's plenty of talent there. I, you know, I love you know, Malik Knowles as a prospect, uh -huh. Joshua Youngblood, Sebastian Taylor, Keenan Garber even, who's probably not going to play. I mean, they have young options, they yep. have experienced options, but I think he's right. If you're going to question a spot on the offense, it's going to be wide receiver. How many snaps do you think Garber gets this season? I don't, I, mean, know gets, I, yeah. great, I don't know that he gets any. I mean, I don't think he – and I think people hear that and they say, oh, what's wrong with Keenan Garber? And why is he not as good as Josh Youngblood? He might be better than him by the end of the career. Yeah. Keenan Garber has legitimate I skill, mean, legitimate skill and, and breakaway speed, yeah. speed that is unique. But yeah, he's very slight. I mean, mm -hmm. like he has a very slight build. Josh Youngblood does not. I mean, yeah. he is thick right now. So just because I don't think Garber's going to play this year, don't write that down as Matt's done with Garber or Garber's not good because he's probably I, we, still yeah. my favorite recruit yeah. class. Yep. The other thing that might limit some of the wide receiver stuff is hearing how much Jordan Brown could factor into the passing well game. Said, yeah. And if you like having him out there, based off what you're going to do a lot of the time, 
at most, to me, it comes off at most, there's going to be two wide receivers on the field at one time. And if you really like Jordan Brown and you throw him out there in the same formation yep. with James Gilbert, that's just a little something different. And I think something that we could probably see tomorrow. I think we will, but your bet even adds to your initial point. If he's your slot receiver in formations, and I bet he will be, I yeah. bet you're right. I, get, I would almost guarantee there'll be plays tomorrow night where James Gilbert's lined up in the in the backfield and Jordan Brown's in the slot. Yep. Now, I mean, that's your that's another receiver. So that's eight guys we're talking about at receiver. So, yeah, there's a couple guys we're hearing about who aren't going to play tomorrow night at receiver. It'll be interesting to see who it is. I think the last thing when it comes to receivers yep. is that if we start to see K-State go on a pretty good stretch of running the ball, I think that's when you might see Malik Knowles, Sebastian Taylor go out on the field at the same time, and they decide it's time to take a shot down yep. the field. That's the situation that I feel like when they talk about Taylor, that's what he thrives in, and that's where they foresee him being a factor this year. Because other than that, he just hasn't popped up elsewhere to be that every down kind of guy. Well said. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's move on to the trenches, a mm. position where you got five seniors starting. Yeah. Talk about this offensive line, Dale. Um, I, 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 I'm trying to think of the right words. I don't want to say everything's interesting, but everything's interesting to me, okay? It just is right now. It's the first game of the season. <laughs> I'm fascinated by everything and by this, too. I mean, uh, this is a group that I think, you know, six, seven months ago, I would have bet you anything Josh Rivas would still start on this team. And then as, as we got closer and closer to camp, we started to hear, man, it's, it's Josh Rivas or Evan Curl and those two guys. And then as you get closer to the end, like, it's probably going to be Evan Curl. And then it's Evan Curl. So th the reason I talk about that is that's the one position we didn't know. We knew the tackles were going to be Nick Kaltmeyer and Scott France, two seniors. Of course, they're all seniors. We knew the center would be Adam Holtorf. We knew a guard would be Tyler Mitchell. Yep. So that's why that one was so fascinating to me. And, yeah, I mean, it's unique to see a guy that hasn't really played. I think that's Greg Hauser. I believe oh, that's yeah. who that is. Maybe yeah. he, I think he runs. I think you're right. He has KSTB, right? That, yeah. he does that. He's got a Reddit page for K-State, I think. I think that's who we just waved at. Yeah. But, anywho. you're right. Um, so that's why that position is fascinating to me. I do believe Rebus will play in this game and still continue to play. But I like Evan Curl's a guy that when you look at him physically, he's got, uh, you know, it's going to sound pretty pretty um, lame to say, but he's got a good body. I mean, yeah. the guy is, is, looks like he has a lot of good weight on him. He has better length than I expected. I don't think he's just one of these fifth-year senior token starter things. He may not start all year, but I don't think it's just to be nice to him. He's going to have a chance to win that job all year long. Mm -hmm. I think offensive line – they'll hit it it's really just about that position right there with Evan Curl and I think the thing to watch is how much they waver back and forth between Revis and Curl how that the snap count evens out for those guys and if it becomes noticeable early on in the game or at some point that Evan Curl isn't getting the job done how quick they are to go and get Josh Revis into the game because another conversation that we had on on the game earlier today is it's tough for people to tell when there's a good or a great offensive line, yeah. but it's really easy to tell when somebody isn't doing their job and there's a bad one. So if things aren't going well for Evan Curl, we know something will stick out and get after way pretty, pretty quickly. So I think that's the thing that's going to be in interesting to me on the offensive line because everybody else, they seem, they seem fine to me, and I'm not too concerned unless – you know, things hit the fan tomorrow and everything starts what to hit? fall apart. Oh, I get it, yeah. <laughs> Flando, it's okay to say. What are you drinking? Tell people what you're uh, having. What are you having I think it's all raspberry rest. jam here. Oh, at that, you know who likes house. that, right? Remember who introduced us to that? Was it, uh, was it a Vasco's boy? It was a basketball player. It was a graduated basketball was player. Was it uh it's was one, it, it wasn't Tay, was it? It was either Gip or DJ. Now I can't remember. Yeah, I think it was Gip. Uh, yeah, no, I think Gip, it was Gip too. Because I remember like, yes. giving him like guff about like, dude, you drink raspberry jam, you know? But yeah, really, <laughs> but but yeah, that's the that's the point, man. I mean, it's a thing where it, even lines yeah. that are playing okay, people can still visualize them as playing poorly. When you if you're not going back and really watching it, but you're right, you'll notice when a guy gets blown up, and that'll be the thing. You know, the first time that mm -hmm. that Evan Curl struggles, the f a fan's gonna think, boy, do they go to Josh Rivas? I hope they don't because I don't want to create a situation yeah. where the first play, and I don't think they will. But yes, if he has a couple bad series, I think they should. And I think I think I, I am skeptical of how many guys are gonna rotate at receiver and D end and yeah. D tackle and D line. But I'm not skeptical of that I think they'll play both those guys at guard on Saturday night. Well, one thing I would add and ask you guys about the offensive line is, how, I mean. If, if guys start going down with injuries, how much depth is, is really at this position? And, and, yeah, what could that look like? Um, it's probably better than we thought, but I think it's still an issue. So I think the guys they're comfortable with would be Noah, Noah Johnson, who's probably the backup center. Uh -huh. I think they're comfortable with him. Obviously, Josh Rivas, so that's seven guys. They always say seven, eight, nine, whatever. At tackle, the one they're most comfortable with is Christian Duffy. If they had to go beyond him and put in two tackles – 
You're looking at Katori Leviston. So I think they have seven they feel good about. Eight if you want to be kind and count Duffy. But he's, again, redshirt freshman. So me saying yeah. he's not ready is not me knocking Christian Duffy. And he might be ready. But it would be a situation, too, where I think – I don't think if they lost a tackle, I don't think playing Duffy's their first move. I think it's probably switching Tyler Mitchell to a tackle, mm -hmm. inserting Noah Johnson either at guard or center, and then sliding Holtorf over. So I think they have seven – enough to feel good about to where with one injury they probably won't feel a drop-off. If you had two guys get nicked up or go down, you're probably putting in somebody that maybe you didn't really want to play. Yeah. Let's move on to the other side of the ball. Stick with the trenches. The defensive line. I mean, I, I like to go inside out, so let's start with the defensive tackles. And uh, oh, thank you so much. Just got my my next raspberry jam. It's so exciting. It's not. Uh, it's only a second, everybody. I mean, like the it. first one, not even finished. I know. You know that's so, you know. Yeah. I only had probably, a coffee tonight. Probably cut me off. I have water. That. I know. I'm, I'm the only one drinking. Yeah. But, you know, I'm not the kind of guy that goes, oh, man, I feel like an alcoholic now. Because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Good. Yeah. Um, so don't judge me. Or do. I don't care. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, let's go inside out. Let's start with the defensive tackles. Mason, tell me. I mean, obviously, Trey Deshaun, he's been around. He's, he's solidified that spot. Talk yeah. about that, that position. Uh, defensive, ta defensive line as a whole, I think, is probably the position that you're most confident in mm -hmm. if you're a K-State fan. Yeah. And defensive end, just because, you know, there's another guy on the other side there that is going to play a pretty important role. We know Wyatt Hubert kind of seems like a lock to play really well. Kyle Ball and Reggie Walker are still kind of a mixed bag of tricks. You don't know what you're going to get every night. I think defensive tackle is one where Trey Deshaun's good enough to where no matter who's going to be next to him, whether it's Mitty or whoever else, they're going to be fine there. And so I think the defensive line for K-State is going to help out not just themselves, but also the guys behind them. We heard earlier in the week that they're wanting to be more aggressive. And that's going to come from up front. Those guys are going to pressure them enough. And those guys can take some more chances because I think there's going to be some more sacks. There's going to be more bad passes by the quarterback yeah. because K-State's so set there. And Trey Deshaun is one of those guys that – He's good enough to cover up for any mistakes that whoever else is inside with him can make, or if there's a you know a lack of energy or just not enough going on from the guys on the end. He's right. There's there's no position on the team deeper than deep at the line, and I'm gonna forget names again. But guys who have just started on that D line. Yeah. You know Reggie Walker, uh, Wyatt Hubert, Kyle Ball, Trey Deshaun, Joe Davies, Jordan Mitty. That's six guys who have started games. Bronson Massey, I don't think it's I don't know if he ever started a game, but he was playing as far back as a redshirt freshman at Oklahoma State two years ago. Uh, Drew Wiley, you know, was, was played as a true freshman two years ago. I mean, I, this is not Clemson's D line. I'm not pretending that it's you know that group from last year with nine first round draft picks, and they have some things to prove too. I'll be interested to see how they play against better offensive lines in the Big 12, but there is more depth there than anywhere else. You mentioned D tackle first. Uh, you, you know, I, I personally am a Joe Davies fan. I think yeah. he's a really good interior pass rusher. Started to get the sense they were going to start Mitty, though, when I wrote my depth chart prediction before that came out. I had Mitty as the other starter at D tackle. And I think it'll be another, you know, they talk so much about situational. I think against the run, uh, thank you. I think against the run, they're probably going to go with Mitty more. If they're expecting pass, maybe Joe Davies. Yeah. Uh, I'll be interested, of course, to see who the fourth D tackle is because it might be Eli Huggins, a sophomore we didn't talk mm -hmm. about a lot until this year, and he might be ahead of Drew Wiley. Uh, Jalen Pickle, redshirt freshman from Cimarron. I don't know that he's going to play a lot, but there is a lot of depth in those positions. But you hope, you know, like 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 Mason said, uh, Kyle Ball, Reggie Walker, both good players, but you don't always know what you're going to get out of them. If those guys become more consistent, there's no reason why this can't be one of the best, I don't know, three, two, three deep in the Man, line for the if, Big 12. If Jalen Pickle and Nick Oss get in the game together, oh, it ought to be the first time two Cimarron guys have been yucking it up in the same <laughs> I mean, game, you know? I mean, I'll tell you what, Cimarron is about to take over because those guys are sophomore and freshmen. you got to keep looking around that area. Uh, absolutely. I do it through Cimarron all the time back in my Garden City days. Back in your Garden yeah. City days. We should yeah. just talk about that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I mean, I've, I've, I've told a thousand times. The dirty G. Next, you know, I live next door to the old coach and stuff. Oh, so we better move to the LBs instead of the GC. Get it? Well, did we did we talk of, about uh, defensive line enough, or yeah. defensive end enough? Boom, Mass is obviously did, backing yeah, up. Probably not enough. Wyatt Huber. I mean, the because real the question, question is Reggie Walker and Kyle Ball. Who's going to start? I would, I would, I would bet Kyle Ball if I were a betting man, and I am sometimes. You know, but uh, <laughs> it could be it could be either. But I think people probably are assuming it's Reggie Walker. What I've 
the stuff I've heard in the last couple of weeks would have suggested it's probably going to be Kyle Ball. In fact, I'd be slightly surprised if it's not Kyle yeah. Ball and Wyatt Hubert starting tomorrow night. Reggie Walker's going to play a ton of snaps, as many as both, probably both those guys. But if I were had to guess, I think I think Kyle Ball will be the other starter at the end. And I agree with that. And my reasoning is a little bit simpler just because Reggie Walker seems like a given to be a starter at defensive end. But for the reason that there's an or there, that's, true. that's what makes me think Kyle Ball is going to be the guy. And it goes back to we talked about backup quarterback. I think Reggie Walker has been so up and down at K-State that they feel like they're just going to get more consistent play and less mistake-made football out of Kyle Ball. And so when it comes down to picking a starter, I think it's going to be him. I think I think you guys nailed it. I think it is time to move on to linebacker. Obviously one of the biggest blows to the team before, I mean, way before the season even, even got started, way before summer even got started, Justin Hughes, uh, in spring got injured and he he's out for the season but Elijah Sullivan obviously a guy that has a lot of potential he got injured early last year as well so there's still a lot to see from him but I think there's a lot of potential when it comes to Sullivan um, and then obviously Daquan Patton's the other guy sitting there he has a lot to prove still from a, 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 a year last year where man you thought he was gonna just explode and be a guy that could really play that position I mean, what do you think, Mason? What do you think out of the, out of those two guys? You think that's enough? I mean, especially when it comes to some injuries that could happen, that position might be the scariest. Yeah, no, linebacker's definitely the scariest. If anything happens to that's all, I'll just cut in. I keep, Casey Leonard is sitting over there. Nick Leonard's dad oh, yeah. is here. I was trying. You should get him on the. I pod. was going to. Yeah, but it's put him in a tough spot. You know, he's just going to praise. <laughs> he's true. just going to praise his kid. That's you know, that's true. No, but his and we already kid, got yeah. through tight end. Yeah, we already got through. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but he's a very nice man. Yes, he uh, is. Yeah. I think tight end is one of those spots right now for K-State where even if it's not a guy that is one of the the starting two out there, you get even a little deeper into that depth chart and somebody goes down, you're already hampered because you're going to have to be cycling guys in and out. Uh, I'm I'm just very concerned about how they're going to play in regards to everything else because I think the expectations have been kind of raised for the defense just because we talked about how good the defensive line is, and I think – I've gained some confidence in some of the defensive backs just because moving Walter Neal from nickel to corner means that you think he gives you a better chance to win games and be a better player at corner. Mm -hmm. And so you're doing things to make this defense even better. And if the linebackers don't come through or you lose a guy, then the defense loses a significant amount there. Here's the problem. (laughs) Here we go. I I was was talking back and forth with Mr. Linners during all that so I didn't listen to a word Mason said. Hey, just said. restart. Yeah, and just so, restart. No, no, no. So, like, we, did, you, did you do good? Do I need to say anything about linebacker? Um, but maybe, I like maybe I, go through the depth of linebacker. Okay, I just worried if I said something you already said, you'd be like, you already said that. So if I do repeat... Tell us every, everybody on team. If I do repeat every word Mason <laughs> percentage said... Percentage chance they get in. It's because I wasn't It's because I wasn't listening to a word he said. But obviously, starters, Daquan Patton, Elijah yep. Sullivan. I've been pretty critical of Daquan Patton's play last year, and I understand that. And some people don't like that, which I, I totally get. I love Daquan Patton as a person, yep. as an athlete. And he was hurt last year. Mm-hmm. Um, he did deal with a broken hand throughout virtually all season. So I think that, I think you should expect and can expect he'll be better this year. Uh, and if he is, I think K State's defense will have a chance to be really good because if Eli Sullivan can stay healthy or Elijah Sullivan, he's probably their best linebacker on the roster, even over Justin Hughes when he's healthy. So you're going to start two, and if those two can play, well, it'll be fine. Daniel Green's had a really, really good camp, gives you a third really quality player. Beyond that, though, I mean, the questions really come. Cody Fletcher, uh, I think, will be out will be, weeks, will be yeah. out longer than it's even been uh, in, uh, intimated. Is that uh-huh. a word? What's that word implied? Yeah. Um, not forever, but I'd be surprised if we see him before conference play. So then you go to Nick Allen, a kid that I'm just going to be totally honest about. I didn't know anything beyond what the coaches have told me. I haven't seen him play. I don't have a great deal of, of knowledge in his background before what I read in his bio. So that's the question. You have... You have three guys you probably feel good playing, and, and maybe that's even two. You know, Daniel Green, again, like, I think it's three. They are comfortable with him, but he doesn't have a lot of experience, that kind of deal. So from a depth perspective, it's the scariest position on the roster. Uh, Cody Fletcher losing him for some period of time certainly doesn't doesn't help. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, I think, I think we covered it. Now okay. we can move on to DBs, which Mason started to cover a little bit. with. Uh, that's what I heard Walter yeah. Neal out there. I was like, oh, we're on DBs no, already? Not, yeah, but listening. it was a good segue so. to, to that to talk about Walter Neal. He's one of those corners. A.J. Parker's the number one guy on the outside. You got Jerron McPherson as the nickel, Denzel Goolsby, and then Wayne Jones, probably the surpri- one of the surprises on the de- defense as knowing the defensive playbook better than anyone 
Uh, just talk about all the defensive backs. I think Wayne Jones is the place to start. I think he, uh, out of all the defenders that I'm curious to watch tomorrow night, he probably would rank number one for me because of what you said. It's just unique to her. And I know it's a new system. And that means that everybody, whether you're a redshirt freshman yep. or Denzel Goolsby, a fifth-year senior, that you have the same time in it. So I understand that helps a redshirt freshman know as much as anybody else. But still, typically, playing experience at the college level helps you understand that stuff faster. He doesn't have that experience, and he still gets it. So I think it's a very good sign for Wayne Jones. He's a good athlete, too. I mean, that's what we were more hyped about coming in was this kid was a really good athlete. So then to be told he's you know knows it as well as anybody is, is really, really impressive. Uh, I'll talk safeties and probably let him cover, you know, corners and nickels, yeah. and then I'll, you know, cover that back after him too if he forgets anything because, you know, Mason. But, <laughs> uh, you know, it's going to be Denzel Goolsby, uh, Wayne yeah. Jones back there, and then Jonathan Alexander is going to back up both spots. And that's a I tough like goal. Alexander. Strong and free safety are significantly different that's positions. True. You know, people, and I get them guilty of it too, to say, oh, safety's a safety. It's, mm-hmm. it's not. You know, I mean, they have significantly different responsibilities. Um, it's like, you know, I don't know, I'm trying to, it's, it's like nickel and corner, you know, I mean, they're not the same position. So for Jonathan Alexander as a Juco player to actually be backing up both those spots is impressive. And Klanerman, Joe Klanerman told me on Thursday, he's like, yeah, it's not fair to him. Like, that's really, yeah. really hard. He, he's probably the third nickel, too, on this team. So um, those are the three guys that will be playing there. And I can't help but be excited to look for Alexander because as far as just guys in uniform, nobody looks better for K-State than Jonathan Alexander at, that's you know, true. at 6'3", 215, 6% body fat. Where's Phil Rivers, number 17? You know, I mean, this guy's got everything going for him uh, to where I hope to see him play some Saturday night. Uh, real quick, I'll add to the safeties, and it's just my thought oh is that I, I feel really good about him just because Denzel Goolsby is a guy. He's a known commodity. You feel pretty confident about what he can do. Look at the not build only on, on the Casey field, Leonard, so but, but, yeah, but leadership-wise. Yes. And then the fact that, you know, maybe it could say something about where you're at with everybody else, but if you're going to be starting a guy – like like Jones out there, I think you feel pretty confident in him, and the safeties are going to be fine. Now, when it comes to corner, that's another one where maybe once you get past the first two guys out there, you yep. got a lot of questions, and that's another spot where you just can't afford to lose a guy. And thinking about it, corner's a spot where, to me, you're probably a little bit more susceptible than some to lose a guy because not only is there stuff that can happen with contact, but also stuff just because they're running so much that, you know, if they start cramping or if something worse happens, that could that it could occur. But the two guys they have out there right now, and A.J. Parker and Walter Neal, I feel good because, like I said, when we were just kind of discussing linebackers, to have the confidence to move Walter Neal from nickel to corner because you think that's what's best for the team, you probably had a pretty good indication of him being a good fit there, and that's why they did it. So I'm good with that. At nickel, Jerron McPherson, we did a segment on the game a couple of weeks ago where – we got a Nickelback song attached to... <laughs> what song did you pick? Do you remember? Oh, I don't remember. I bet it rhymed, like, really over the top. You Probably. Know, like, every one of their songs, like, is like a, is like a nursery rhyme. Right? But we got, exactly. but we got a Nickelback song Nick attached Nick to a Nickelback. <laughs> and out of all of the... We get it. We Nickelback, had, Nickelback. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we had three, three actual names and then other. And so I was assigned other... And Jerome McPherson falls into the other list. He was a guy that three weeks ago we weren't thinking no. necessarily yeah. of being the nickel. And so that's another all. thing where I just say if he came up like this, kind of out of nowhere, they feel good enough to put him there. And just because I know people like to be hard on Jonathan Durham, but he's just not completely terrible. He's, he's out not. there. He can do no. some good things for him. So for him to supersede Jonathan Durham, yeah. they're probably in an okay spot there. And like I said, I think this defensive line is good enough to take a lot of pressure off of some of the guys behind them just because I think they can be that good, especially against a team like Nichols. Yeah. I want to I want to expand even. He makes great points about Wayne Jones starting and Jerron Jer- McPherson starting because they both didn't have to, like he said. If they if they wanted to be really conservative, at safety they could have defaulted to Goolsby and Alexander, who's a you know junior with playing experience, or Jerron McPherson. Exactly. Safety yeah. there. There and there. And like go. you said, at Nickel. Uh, I will tell anybody who wants to listen, Jonathan Durham's not as bad as people think he is. Um, he's a better football player than you give him credit for. And, and now, I'm not saying he should be the starting nickel. That's not my point. I like Durham McPherson a lot, and I'm going to talk about him in a second. But it's the same thing. They didn't have to do that. They could have played Durham there and had an experienced, you know, good athlete at that position. It shows you two, two things. One, those positions probably are in decent shape. And then two, this staff is different than the previous staff. You would never see a guy less experienced, uh, younger, in a, in a close battle, jump up and start. Yeah. It was always the old guy. So now you can at least, and I'm not knocking the other staff for that. I'm just saying it's a difference. And now you can know that's going to happen going forward. And my point on McPherson, he, 
I think everyone has that player where they watch a guy, and in the back of the head, they think he's really, really, really good, yep. but no one else is talking about it, so you feel too stupid to bring it up. <laughs> so, like, and that's my guy, Jeremy McPherson. I remember like, last I thought, year you bring it up. I thought he was fantastic time, yeah. last year, mm-hmm. and I know PFF grades are not gospel. I say it every time I bring it up, but his PFF grades were fantastic. It's one where they matched up. Like, my watching of him and his grades was like, this guy's a really good football player. Um, We'll see how he does, but I love the idea of him at nickel. Uh, and it's kind of more of a big nickel, you know, to where he could be more physical against the run probably. Yeah. But I'm really, really interested to see him play because I thought he was really good last year, and I think this could be a great role for him. And it does it does help, too. If it comes down to it, safety start to get thin, you could move McPherson back to no that doubt. position and then put in, uh, put in the kid. <laughs> yeah, the old kid, Jonathan Durham. <laughs> Jonathan Durham. <laughs> Number six. <laughs> Uh, one other thing I'll I say swear he's a good player. about the corners is <laughs> last year, Kevion McGee got in the game. Oh, the times, I and, I, and I, I didn't think that he was as bad I like as Kevion. I think others would, would think. I think he did a pretty good job in those situations. So corner has a little bit of depth, but it's I just mean, not as Kevion, much as though, you would like. A, I guess that, do, that did help me remember, though, a true freshman that I think could be very good and, and get some time, obviously, at least in four games, is Logan Wilson. Yeah, uh, Dale. Tell me about Logan Wilson. No, like, what you think? <laughs> I mean, do you think he could? He could. Uh, I mean, play. He's not going to skip his red shirt, but do you think he plays? Well, I would say I maybe he could. I mean, he, if it gets yeah, thin, yeah. Too thin I, I, no, I'm like battling with like what to share and what not to share. Uh, there are some people that are under the impression that Logan Wilson will not red shirt this year. Ooh. Um, now. That's that's now, I, but again, that, that could become a battle of semantics. You know, does that just mean he's going to play this year and we'll see what happens? They yeah. plan on playing him. I don't think they. I'm pretty confident they haven't sat down and said, "There's no way we redshirt Joe Irvin yeah. or Logan Wilson or Joshua Youngblood." But I do think I think what I think about I can say for him is they would be fine with playing him throughout the year. I don't know if be necessary yeah. though, but and maybe it will because like I I like Kevin McGee. I thought he played pretty well last year. Yep. Daryl Patterson, I haven't seen him play enough to really judge. But both those too, guys yeah. are. Experienced guys who haven't lit the world on fire, right? I mean, so then you look at a Lance Robinson, a redshirt freshman, or a Logan Wilson as a true freshman, and they will get opportunities to play. I know Logan Wilson, the guys will tell you he's, you know, uh, a different, I think that's the word they use, he's a different looking athlete out there than some of the guys they're playing at at corner. I remember hearing that description from, I think, a coach or a player and thinking, man, that's very (laughs) honest, you know, but also, you know, kind of doesn't speak super highly as the other corners. But uh, I think he's going to have a real chance to play. I don't know that I expect him Saturday. But it, would, it wouldn't absolutely stun me because I think on the defensive side, I'm just making sure I'm not forgetting a name that's more likely. He's probably their their best true freshman right now yeah. is probably Logan Wilson. Yeah. To what Matt said right there, the corner depth is one of those things where it just doesn't seem strong enough because there are so many unknowns. you got young guys, but also, as he said, Daryl Patterson's a guy there and just haven't seen enough of him. And you know, plenty of stuff has gone on in Daryl Patterson's case state career already to kind of say – we don't know what's going to happen next. But uh, I think you're at least in a position, if you're K-State, to think that maybe for a game or so you can see if things play out if one of your starters is, is to go down. And then after that is maybe when you start to make some of these rash decisions and say, this guy doesn't get his red shirt this year because we got a blame or you know, just trying to figure out other options. But I think they're in a position right now where it's unknown on what the, the depth looks like but they'd be willing to give it a shot without panicking too quickly. Man, this segment has just been really fun, I think. I hear We're about really to has. finish it off with special teams. All we got to talk about is the ankle snapping. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I, have you ever seen, like, I, I don't want to overstate how good that was. But that was like, good. But I, it's one of those that things everyone's like, funny. have you seen the ankle video? Have you seen yeah. it? And so you immediately get kind of, like, snarky about it. Like, I'm not going to like it. It's not going to be good. <laughs> and that's how I got the feeling. And I watched it. I was like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Like, I mean, wow. it was so well done. The ending th- is quality. You know, <laughs> holding the chip and the explosion, beautiful. I, it was so well done. Uh, it was the antithesis of the power towel. I mean, it's like K-State doing something that is so – in tune with just that how needs things to be are played done. before the game right. tomorrow. Just exactly, just so in tune with like what's funny, what people are into these days. I loved it. Uh, I mean, Devin Ankle, <laughs> you know, his previous career or his previous highlight was calling Tom Brady a system quarterback. Yeah. I believe walking out of the oh, here one day um, after, after loading that Bill Snyder. So if you're, yeah, I don't know, you're going to find a holder in the country one <laughs> who's in better physical shape. And I don't know and if you two, guys saw more it. attitude. I don't know if you guys saw it too, but I'm pretty sure at the KU basketball game he may have had a sign that said that. I think or he one did. of the basketball he did. games he That's brought. Awesome. A sign and I can imagine that, that the, the energy Devin Ankle brought to the student section that night in Brambridge. <laughs> I mean, uh, talk about the most built. 
punter right. or slash kicker in all right. of And have you seen football. him play basketball? No. No, oh, he gets after it at the rec, too. And, and intramurals, I've seen his team play before. Yeah. Man, Devin Ankle, and I'm not just saying this to kiss up to him. Like, that's an example of a guy that I'd like to be. Like, I used to always joke, like, I wish I could learn to be a good holder and just hold for a football team. <laughs> like, I would love to be this ripped holder wearing a tight cutoff jersey, you know, just catching him with one hand yep. to show off a video. Like, and you know, inevitably, the first time he mishandles one, everyone's going to groan. I'll say it right now. He's not going to mishandle one because of that video. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't a poor use of time. They probably spent four or five hours putting that thing together, and it's awesome. It is. But about the unit specifically, I mean, you got yeah. a, a potential all-conference punter, legitimately in Devin Ankle. Blake Lynch uh, played at times like an all-conference kicker last year. So your actual specialist as kicker and punter, you're in great shape, I think. Uh, experience at holder, as much as we joke about that, that's important. That's a way to you know lose a game is to mishandle yeah. a hole and miss a field goal from it. So I like everything they've got at the specialists. I like Phillip Brooks as a return man. I don't think he has a ton of straight line speed, but he has enough. I'm not saying he's David Allen. He's not David Allen because he's never returned you know, a kick this year yet. But David Allen didn't have a lot of straight line speed either. If you go back and watch some of those returns, it was just very shifty side to side and then had good speed upfield. I think that's what they hope Brooks is, a guy who's going to make the first guy miss, not beat you with 4-3 speed, you know, like a Tyreek Hill or an Aaron Lockett or one of those guys. Um, but I'm interested to see him play. But that unit, I, I still have concern about. Like, yeah. And I've said this 100 times, so people are tired of hearing it. But I, I feel like it's impossible to take away as much emphasis as the previous staff placed on it and think it'll be just as good. But how much difference will there be? If there's not much of a difference, I think the gain they will get an off of the defense by putting their time and practice on that is absolutely worth it. But I want to see how it's going to be. I mean, we, we you know, college football season's early, but we were listening to games on the way home from, from Nebraska last night, and we heard about Minnesota really struggling with special teams. And team, it could still impact a game. It's not as important as it used to be, but it could still impact a game. And Minnesota, you know, could have lost to South Dakota State last night, should have lost to them at home, if not for two second-half turnovers by the Jackrabbits. And part of that was because they gave them some big plays on special Man, teams. Man, did you see one of those interceptions South no, Dakota I didn't State see, threw? No, I haven't seen any it of them. It was atrocious. Was it the pick six in the third quarter, yeah, you know? It yeah, it was awful. It's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Yeah. It is ugly. Well, I mean, and just listen to that broadcast, too, you know. And it was the Golden Gophers Network, so they were pretty big homers. But... <laughs> I mean, to talk about how many turnovers the defense forced. And like I said, I'd heard the pick six was terrible. And then the fumble was just a mishandled handoff in the backfield where they didn't get hit. And I'm like, we uh. force one more thing, though. Speaking of announcers, <laughs> oh, if you I, I have, if you have any you. chance to ever Dude. listen to a Utah radio broadcast, their color guy is British. No, they're they're sideline they're guy. They're sideline yeah, guy. Yeah. Sorry, the sideline reporter is British, and it is the heaviest British accent you've ever heard. And it's just something I've never experienced before. What do you got there? A home run on for the, for the well, Royals? Well, that's that's time Moustak's there single it is. season it home run record. The KSO show. Holy he's, cow. He's matched with Breaking moves. news. You know? Yeah. Um, Breaking news live. On Breaking moose. <laughs> Secondary news. We stole it from K-Man. Secondary news reporters. <laughs> moose has just been tied. But in this reporter, like, you're not ready for it. And they go to oh him. Like, Let's, I don't remember his name. Let's go down to Grant Flanders on the sideline and you hear, and you hear this thick British accent. Zach Moss got the football and moved it down the field. Unfortunately, the Utes missed the extra point. Unfortunate. Back to you guys in the booth. And I'm like, <laughs> it's the greatest thing ever. So if you ever get a chance to listen to a Utah the Holy War. podcast, the Holy War, they were good anyway. But you add in a British uh, sideline reporter. Oh, man. We got like we, we joked around in the car, but we sh- should do it. We, we're we're going to get him on the, the show. We've got to. Like, I think we're it'd gonna be have amazing. His own little minute and, yeah. or five minutes, whatever right. he wants. And that'd be a lot of fun. I don't know if it's offensive, but every time I heard him, be careful. <laughs> every time I heard him, I was, I was, I was thinking of a soccer game. I don't well, know. that's not offensive. No, Jay, no I mean, <laughs> whoa, I was, I was hearing that or like the the classic, like what's the golf guy, the famous golf announcer? Who's, oh, Nick Faldo. Yeah, I mean, well, there's another. Yeah, but just it's that. that there's voice. plenty of them. But it's just that voice, and yeah. they sound so classy, and like everything is so well thought out and so patient. I'm just jealous of it, and he was great. No, he was. But uh, I think that wraps up this segment, right? You have any, does. anything to no, add? I got nothing. Uh, next segment, we're going to come back and take a look around the Big 12. Uh, again, this segment was brought to you by People's State Bank and Legacy Insurance. Check them out. We'll be right back. We're back with segment two of the KSO Show presented by People's State Bank and Legacy Insurance. This segment is sponsored by Tallgrass Tap House, where we're at right now, Harry's and Bourbon and & Baker. All three located on the same street. We've been going to Bourbon and Baker a lot more lately. Such a good place. I think it's because Lowry always wants to go to Bourbon and Baker. He does. Which is great. I mean, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying, like, we used to be coming here all the time, Tallgrass, and now a little more Bourbon and Baker. Mason still, maybe you take us to Harry's. I've never been to Bourbon and Baker or Harry's. I've only been to Tallgrass. Next time we go to Bourbon and Baker, we got to go. We got to go. 
it's a fun place, man. It's so good. The, you know. I mean, food food at Tallgrass is good. It's a, different, Baker is, yeah, it's a different kind of... It's, it's another... The conglomerate of restaurants yeah. they have going here, the smells dominate the air on points, and it's very good. They it do. is. Yes, you it step is. out of the car, and you go, man. Man, points is so much hotter these days than when I was a student. I mean, like, when I was a kid back, you know, in 1927, like, points, <laughs> it, it, you couldn't do anything down here. Now, you go to points all the time. Yeah. See, I live above Harry's. Every you time do. I step outside... What a location I know. that you live in. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I step outside my, apart, or my apartment in that hallway... Oh my god! Just whiffs, just wafts. You ever in like, there. you ever like check the so trash good. in the back? Oh, I never have. <laughs> that that doesn't. That's where I park yeah. around. That yeah. doesn't smell great, yeah. but maybe yeah. fresh well, food. Would I was be. suggesting maybe there's some some free food in there. There dumpster. probably would be. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. always the the smell from the food that was days ago. But yeah, that, that, uh, true. The food that uh, night would still be good. Um, but yeah, this this segment we're just gonna go game by game in the Big Twelve and make our predictions. And man, I love having like football actually back to talk. Oh, it feels man. good. Oh. Man. Really I was does. so excited last night. I was like, man, I get to go home, watch football. And then I didn't because I had to go do <laughs> severe weather coverage. But, but the thought of getting to do football was yeah. fun. Worst, so Worst weather ever. Go I ahead. Know, I'm, oh I'm ruinous. Let's talk big well. Insane. Well, no, you're not. But t- let's talk about the first game that's ha- going to happen tonight at 930 because it's obviously out in the West Coast against Oregon State, Oklahoma State, the Cowboys, starting the season off against their Power 5 team. Who do you who do you have in this before day? I, I mean did, did yeah. Kurtz Take I haven't listened through. to the show today did Kurtz end up making this one of his picks he did he did it yesterday actually okay. yeah so he's already off to a one and zero start yeah he, he took Cincinnati minus two and a half over UCLA he took Oklahoma State minus fifteen over Oregon State I mean I think Okie State's gonna win easy pick for me you know for uh, the Cowboys yeah I don't think they are gonna return to the ten win Oklahoma State team that they were for three or four years in a row, but I think they're gonna be better than they were last year. Oregon State's the KU of you know Pac-12 football. They're not very good. Uh, Okie State should win, but I, I tell you what, I don't like Kurtz having that as one of his picks of the week. I, I think that could be a ten to thirteen point margin. Yeah, that is kind of silly and, and I mean I just a road game, yeah. first game of the year. I'm not I mean I think Oregon State's terrible. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I just think road game for this game of the year that makes me nervous. I, I agree with that. I think I, I would take Oklahoma State in the same way, I would take Oklahoma State and minus 15, just because I think Oregon State is that bad. They're really bad. And Oklahoma State will get some figured out. And I don't think anybody cares about football out there in Beaverton anymore. Also, fun fact, I like to call it the uh, the house that Potato Salad built because <laughs> Reesers is a stadium sponsor. They're the people that makes like the potato salad in stores and stuff like that. Man, there's so many cool the house that I mean like. <laughs> The there's house so, many, there's so many. There's so many. House of Potato Salad Bill. There's that, so many unintimidating names we could come up with for that stadium now. <laughs> you know what I mean, but anyway, yeah. So we all like you like the Pokes. Yes, give me the Pokes. Yeah. Easy. Obviously, we're going to save the K State Nichols game for end of this podcast. You see the Nichols people walk in here. There's some Nichols fans in here. Yeah, I mean that. That's. I gonna, thought about putting them on just to get their perspective. But what if they're like mean? I mean they're it, probably it'd not. It still make but, a good good for the KSO show. Yeah, but yeah. If, if they walk on by, we'll oh, have to yeah, grab them. Yeah. The next game, it's an 11 o'clock game. This one is in. Hey, Sam Shields is in here, too. This I know. It's a celebrity great. packed place I tonight. Know. We saw Greg Hauser. We saw Sam Shields. We've and his nice Casey, mom, Jill Shields, who works for the case. Yeah, we've yeah. seen Jill. That's probably a bigger celebrity, yeah. if we're being honest. And we've seen Nick. I mean, holy cow. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Back to sports. <laughs> an Iowa game. This is all staying in Iowa. Iowa State, number 21 in the nation. Wow. Inviting in Northern Iowa. Northern yeah, Iowa. This is the first book time it and cook it. Years and years. How the many? first book it and cook it. <laughs> How many years has it been since Iowa State has been uh, ranked in the top twenty-five? I mean, preseason, in, in preseason forever. Yeah. I can't. I would have to go look. Was, I don't. No, they seem to play uh, every year. That Northern Iowa game seems to be like just a down to the wire barn yeah. burner. It seems like they lose it all the time too, and they probably only lost it a couple of times. I mean, I'll take Iowa State. I think they're legitimately pretty good. It would not surprise me if this is close, though. I'm taking Northern Iowa just to be different. Oh. I, I want to hate on Iowa State every time I come on here. Every time, anytime I'm anywhere. Somebody says Ames, Iowa State. I'm gonna say terrible. They're not gonna do anything. Yeah, get them <laughs> I mean, out. Of the here. last time they played a, a small team from the Sarah, it was Drake at the end of the season last year, and they beat them by twenty by three, twenty seven, twenty four to close the season. That's so true. Iowa State does not have a history of hammering they, teams like this. And they lost some guys. Yeah, too. I don't think Mason's crazy. I don't, I don't think, think he is either. But, but I'll, I'll take the clones. Give me the clones. I'm just covering both bases. So if the clones win, I'm right. If they lose, I can say I told you. I thought Mason had a good idea. You're yeah, right. I'm Iowa State for me. I'm gonna actually. I don't know. If, I don't know if it works for football, but. The state of Iowa like has some deal where Iowa, Iowa State, like Northern Iowa all have to I think play they each have other. To. I think it's a rule. I, think it's I know in basketball it has to happen, but in football I think it might be the same thing. Speaking yep. of basketball, Larry Bird is headed to Lawrence mm. for an 11 
<laughs> Could you o'clock. imagine if Larry Bird's there tomorrow, 11 a.m. kick? <laughs> In Lawrence, that would be... <laughs> that would be he so takes good. Paul Pierce with him, two Celtics legends, going uh, head-to-head. <laughs> I, I still wouldn't watch. I love it. No. no, I wouldn't watch, but yeah. Indiana State headed to Lawrence. Who you got, man? Indiana State. I love it. Okay, you lost the opener to Nichols last year at home, but I... KU. Indiana State. All right. I love that. Right. See, Iowa State and KU, I just want to pick against them every time I hear yeah. them. Nothing more annoying, unless Wichita State still had a football oh, they team. Oh, a team. I'd pick against oh, them Oh, I would hammer group. them all the time. I would, too. Yeah, no Get them on the Wichita schedule State. for 2025 at a neutral site. In Cessna <laughs> Stadium, maybe? Maybe play them at their place. Uh, well, you know, I mean, where you go down there, good, fine. You could play against Salina. It would be a good neutral site, K-State-Wichita State game. Um... At the Kansas Wesleyan Coyotes? I tell you what, just bring it to my to my area, Gowan Stadium and Hutch, you know? Yeah. Fill those oh, stadiums. No doubt. Seats. Who does who does the who does Wichita State what conference do they join if they were they to make probably, a football? Uh, uh, Missouri Valley. They're, in the, football. they're in the American. That is they're true. In the American, they're the American, American I guess, does, and everything yeah, else. So yeah. That is true. I guess yeah. they could just stick in the American, but man. Yeah. And then what? They pull players from each American team, like it's an expansion. Well, I'll tell you what, <laughs> it's a different. That topic, would be fun if they did that in college. <laughs> I've always said, man, K State and KU should never want to see Wichita State come back into existence in football because it will absolutely hurt those schools. Because all these walk-ons going to K State and KU, maybe getting scholarship offers to play one double A or D two football, Wichita State. Better hope it don't happen. Uh, okay. Hope it don't happen. I hope it don't happen. Yeah. And then they'd probably bring back alumni Bill Parcells to coach him. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you get yeah. you get the tuna in there coaching the real him up. Big, big tuna. Yeah, the real big tuna. The real yeah. big tuna. Yeah. Um, now this one I think is interesting. Okay. FCS team heading to Morgantown. One of the better FCS teams, James Madison. I think they're number three or something. DY. Yeah, I think that's so. What this is saying. this is my FCS pick. You guys have already picked. You know, FCS teams to win every single <laughs> game that happens. This is mine. I think, James, and I believe this will happen. I think James Madison goes to West Virginia. Uh, beats the Mountaineers. And I think it's not sound, but I think they win by a touchdown, and it's a game that doesn't feel like a fluke. James yeah. Madison over West Virginia. How about that? I, I'm going with West Virginia in this one. Of course. I, well, you know, be a little different, whatnot. <laughs> be a little different and whatnot. I just think, you know, Go needs, the home needs to happen. Team. I think West Virginia, they're not going to be great, but I also think that they're getting slided a little they bit. They probably are. I still are. think that they're a decent team. And, I mean, they're in the position right now where – they have their quarterback this year is going to be an Oklahoma transfer. Austin yeah. Kendall was there yep. in Norman for a while, and so I feel like they're going to be okay there. They'll figure some yeah. things out. And if Neil Brown is, you know, the coach that some but, people thought he was back in December when he was in the mix for K State, but how then good, they'll be okay. But, but how good can Austin Kendall be if he couldn't beat out the last two guys to play at Oklahoma? That's true. You know, in front of him, I mean, like, nah, and he didn't even want to right. attempt he to take on. Can't you know, beat out Baker. <laughs> can't beat out Kyle Murray. <laughs> so I mean, like, I yeah, <laughs> wouldn't even take on Jalen Hurts. Yeah, I mean, no, I've heard nothing but good things about about Austin Kendall, and I think he's a good player. And I don't think their program is going to be. I think Neil Brown's going to do a good job. I just think this is a good team they're playing. Uh, if K State was playing James Madison, you probably wouldn't like my prediction, you know, on Saturday. Ooh, so uh, uh, I think it's going to be a tough matchup for for West Virginia. Uh, I'm probably going to sound stupid because I'm picking all these FCS teams. Yeah. Like, Give me James Madison. Wow, the Dukes. <laughs> yes. Hey, West Virginia is starting to turn into like transfer quarterback you because okay. even before Will Greer came from Florida, yep. if you remember, Clint Trickett came from Florida State. Yep. And so they're just loading up on him. They say, hey, yeah, you hate these it, guys, we love them. Three straight, is that three straight starters then basically? Because they didn't go Trickett Greer. Was there somebody between them? might have been somebody between them, but I'm not Let's sure. Let's pretend there wasn't to say it's three straight. Yeah, three yeah. straight. Who's Ish. next on the agenda here? Montana State headed to Lubbock to take on those Texas Tech Red Raiders, Mason. Well, I think Cliff Kingsbury is going to have the team ready to play. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted I wanted to go through my whole Texas Tech thing serious and act like Cliff Kingsbury is still the coach, but I don't want people to think that I'm an actual idiot. So <laughs> some people don't uh, get it. Yeah, that's true. Texas Tech will just win. Whatever. Who cares? I like Tech. I like Tech. Well, I, I think Matt Wells is my Actually, second. They're playing Montana State. Montana State. Uh-oh. Montana State's no slouch. Yeah. Yeah, give me Montana State. <laughs> I'll not? take them all. The only FCS team he has not taken is the one of the best in the country in James Madison. Against West Virginia. Oh, a bunch of scrubs. <laughs> a bunch of JMU. Um, I like Matt Wells. Out of the four new coaches of the Big 12, he was the second most impressive to me after Chris Kleiman. I think Tech's got some sneaky good weapons. I think Alan Bowman can be a star. Um, they still got TJ Vasher at receiver. I, I'm not. I, I think Tech's not going to be world beaters. They may not even go to a bowl this year, but I like their program, and I'm comfortable taking them over Montana State, over the Grizz. And I think their defense started to step it up even in the last few years a little of, bit. of a little bit. Kingsbury. And, yeah, I think you get a new coach in there, Matt Wells, and I think he's going to 
uh, roll through Montana State. What are they? The Grizz. The Grizzlies. Grizzlies. I think it says like the no, Grizz. Montana. No, Montana is the Grizz. Oh, Montana the, State. They're the Bobcats. I just, I just did yeah. the K State KU thing to Montana. Montana and honestly, State. Uh, so for all them me saying that Montana State's no slouch, that's from like three, four years ago when they beat Montana in like the opening weekend. So yeah. he's saving himself for if Montana yeah. State doesn't right. win. No, no, no. Still confident. Red Raiders. <laughs> ugh. Stephen F. Austin heading to Waco. Dale, who do you have in this one? Baylor, Stephen F. Austin. More FCS at well, you Texas know, at action. 12. Brad Underwood's bunch. Hopefully, <laughs> that's, that's a Mason-like joke. Uh, you know, Stephen F. Austin's another good, another good FCS team from what DY's told us and what I've learned. But I think Baylor might be one of the top four or five teams in the Big 12 this year. I think Matt Rule's doing a, a legitimately good job there. They have a lot back, especially receiver. I feel like Chris. I mean, they have all those receivers again with with Corey Brewer. Uh, is it Corey Brewer back? Why am I feeling? Uh, yeah. No. Why is no. Like, that's wrong? Why is their quarterback? I feel like I'm saying it wrong. Well, I'll say it's Corey. Is no, it that's Corey Brewer? Corey Brewer was the guard for the Florida Gators. No, it's Corey Brewer. Is it still Corey Brewer's number 12? Anyway. Charlie Brewer. Charlie oh, Brewer. <laughs> look at, look at Mason. Corey he Brewer, the member of the 2011 I mean, NBA champion Mavericks. Corey Brewer might still be in the NBA. He, I'm not he, sure he's ever that scored headband 10 points just keeps going higher on that ball. His hairline is like mine, so he keeps Ugh. pushing it back. Charlie Brewer, the Baylor yeah, quarterback. Yeah. I don't love him. Matt Rule does, though. He's got weapons. Baylor will be fine in this game. Yeah. Um, they would lose if Corey Brewer was tossed in the rock. I'm going to say, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna say yeah. Baylor wins this one. Also, Matt Rule. Probably just because he has the name Matt and they both have beards, but he's kind of like a shorter, stubbier version of Matt Hall. Ooh. Ooh. You know? Interesting. I mean, I don't know that I just – he has better hair, but he's shorter. Like, eh, that's a does trade-off. he, though? Well, I think it's I think he good. tries too hard with his hair. Oh, I think I disagree. He gets a little John Kurtz-like with that hair. He tries a oh, little too hard. I'm trying too hard. Holy cow. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I think I disagree because, believe it or not, I like Dale. Mm-hmm. And I don't think I like – I mean, maybe I would if I talked That's honestly why I was upset because I won't, I won't say who she compared him to, but my <laughs> wife, when she first saw Matt Rule speak and sent me a text, like, Matt Rule reminds me of this guy that we're, you know, not super fond of. And so, like, here – in that, like, I, I mean, but hey, you're being honest. You're just hey, being you know. honest. But so, oh, also, I forgot yeah. to mention, he does have darker skin than you. He's just he's a more tan, tan guy. Very tan. Which makes me think he's also doing a lot of traveling how, in the offseason. How is he getting so tan? Well, up I guess probably probably out there in uh, Waco, he's outside. Him and Matt Campbell are both just yeah. incredibly oh tan. Oh, yeah. Like, incredibly tan. And Sus- Matt Campbell's been in Toledo tan. and Ames. They're both suspicious. That dude's it got is. a tanning bed in his house. It's almost like they spent at least, like, a month in Mexico or something together or, too, in the I'm same just, spot. I'm just going to say it. They all fake bake like three days a week. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. Now the question is. I'm pretty sure that's what's going do on. Do all that Matt's do this because on. they're both named Matt? I did fake bake, which is <laughs> tanning, back before a trip to uh, Jamaica, I think, for my honeymoon. So I have absolutely I mean, it, it's, done it. It's a smart thing to do, um, I think. It didn't work. I burned place. really hard. So. <laughs> well, then I guess maybe you shouldn't have done it. But nope. did you do it to Miami before Miami nope. at all? So, yeah, there's no point. Um. What was I going to say? Anyway, let's move on to the next game. Louisiana Tech headed to Austin to take on, take on a Texas team. A couple that, of FBS teams. How about that? Uh, well, let, let me tell you, Texas wins this one pretty yeah. easy. Yep, yep. Um, yeah, Texas. I, Texas you know, man. it's weird. People have bounced back and forth on how much they love Texas or don't. I still like Texas this year, but I'm lower on Sam Ellinger than some are, which yeah. is weird because I feel like the people that are high on Ellinger are like, well, Texas, they may not be all the way back yet. So I think Texas wins this one, and they don't really have anything to worry about until Oklahoma. I think I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but on Texas, I think I'm with you. Like, I mean, I still I like them too, but I still don't think they're really any different than last year. Nine, nine, maybe ten win team. You know, I mean, and the Big Twelve could make them a better team. Right. We, the debate all the time is 2012 K State, by far and away, maybe not even a top ten team that year, but schedule fell in their favor, and they played well against Oklahoma, and everybody else was down. Just a, just a note here. That girl who just walked by stared at you for a solid eight seconds. I was, Did you notice that? I noticed at least three seconds of okay, it. Yeah, it was she very, probably was, wondered why you were wearing a high school right. soccer jersey. Correct. Right. She probably looked at what is this kid doing here? With He's his got, <laughs> I say kid. She was a young lady, too. I think she thought you were a nice guy. Oh, well, that's that's. Yeah, nice we all part. like the horns. Yeah, the horns. Big. And I'm actually with you guys. I don't know if Ellinger, or maybe you didn't even say this. You I agree kinda, with Mason. Yeah. I, don't, I think he's a good player. I don't he think is, he's not Tim Tebow. No, he's not Tim Tebow. I don't yeah. see him winning uh, Offensive Player of the Year in the Big 12. Me neither. Yeah. And Man, that. That still has me fired up that everybody was like Ellinger. I would have had in my top three. Like I said, I voted C.D. Lamb. My number two would be Jalen Hurts. Yeah. And then I would have maybe gone Ellinger. Yeah. You know, I mean, but Al- yeah. Anyway. 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 No uh, Ellinger. Last game 
on this slate is uh, Ar- P- Arkansas Pine Bluff. They're heading, oh. heading to uh, Fort Worth to take on those TCU Horned Frogs. I tell you, the Blazers, what a team. <laughs> uh, Are they the Blazers? Yeah. Is that what they're called? The UAPB it. Blazers. And if you notice, their logo, at it's least like the old lion. one, Are used you to have. UAB? Yeah, it used to. No, it's UAPB, U- University of Arkansas Pine Bluff. And it used to have. But UAB is UA- also the Blazers. Yes. Okay, to yeah. make sure we were on the same yeah. page. Right. Yeah. And UAPB has the UAPB in like their logo. It, oh, it I love that. It comes in like the flames or something. Eastern Washington nails that better than anybody. When we saw last year the game oh. in uh, Frisco, I would say Fargo in Frisco for the FCF Championship. <laughs> Go check out the Eastern Washington logo. They they can teach how to build That's letters. A, oh, they are logo. they're the Golden Lions. I don't know why I thought they you were thinking the of UAB. Thinking no, of UAB. I don't I don't think so. But I was I gonna just, say they got a line for a, thi- uh, a little, <laughs> little logo. They also they also changed their logo, so I, it, it looks a little. <laughs> Maybe they were the Blazers. Now. Maybe they, Maybe they were. I don't Maybe know. No, I think they were probably yeah. Golden Lions. But anyways, <laughs> uh, they don't really matter because they're playing the 2019 Heisman Trophy winner Alex Delton, the first. Hayes the Hayes hurler. Hashtag new come profile out pick yet again. <laughs> a starting quarterback in the Big 12. Not right. only has he done it for one team, like a lot of guys in history have. Michael Bishop only started for one Big 12 team. <laughs> Baker Mayfield. Well, he did start hey, for ba- two. I was going to say Baker. You better. Yeah. Baker did start for two. So ha- how about that? Uh, Colt McCoy only one. So guys like that. I mean, I mean, uh, Jason White, Sam Bradford. Go down the list. All these great QBs. Yeah. <laughs> never had it in and to start at multiple schools. No, nope, exactly. 12. And Alex Dalton, he's doing that. And he's going to oh, light up UAPB. It's going to be beautiful. Uh, and, yeah, new profile pick in solidarity, Team Alex, Hayes Hurler. That's my profile picture on Twitter right now. I also like TCU. <laughs> I'm also sincerely, I mean, it's like happy for Alex Dalton to get this opportunity. Yeah. Uh, I think he's a good kid. I think he went through a bad situation. Like Skylar Thompson did. It was handled poorly throughout last season, so I'm glad he's got this opportunity. Great player. Uh, I think he's a good player. I think Max Dugan will beat him out by week three and be the starter at TCU if you want to know. But, hey, if he doesn't, if he doesn't, Delhi could win the Heisman. But we both like yeah. TCU. I think Alex Dalton runs for over 100 yards in this game. Horn Frogs roll. Ooh, man, I can't wait to see all five out there, even though he's not wearing five wearing anymore. Six, why is he wearing 16? I mean, there's a, I mean, I mean, like I was thinking, like there's so many single digits. Well, he, he sat, took, he sat behind Jesse Ertz. I was going to say that's Jesse Ertz. So well. maybe, maybe it is. Maybe it's out of respect to Mr. Ertz. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, give me the Horn Frogs all day, every day. Should we just stick in the same segment and do the K State stuff too? It makes sense. We, we don't need a third segment. Yeah, because yeah, we know? don't have a sponsor for the third segment. Yeah, really. I mean, we want to keep you know talking about tall grass. And yeah, Harry's tall grass, and Harry's, and Harry's, and Bird, and Bakers. And we can get you insurance. We can get you a bank. We can get you somewhere to eat. <laughs> I mean, we're getting close. Uh, we have Lauren on our Lauren Farwell on our board. You can get you a, a house. Um, I just we have a lot of a lot of people. We can, yeah, there we you Mason, go. Mason, you can get you funny rhyming words. Yeah, I can do whatever you need me to do. Yeah. So yeah, let's do the, let's, let's do cats. Let's do the cats. I mean, this is gonna be. Obviously, we're going to finish this off with our predictions, but first we want to start off by uh, talking about top Wildcat performer. Well, I guess we were doing that with predictions. Correct. You're right. Yeah, so first we do the the three keys to the game, and I want you to start this off. Sure. So I I already – I'm just stealing this as what I wrote. So, I, you know, we did our premium prediction on the site. If you haven't read it, I think it's premium anyway. But uh, so the three keys I look for is, one, they've got to be able to battle, you know, emotion with excitement. I know how cliche oh, – they're all cliche, but they're all true. And Kleiman did a great job of talking about it, I thought, Mason. Like, he knows they're going to be amped up. He knows it'll probably lead to a mistake or two, and he's not going to try to stifle that. Yep. But it really is about battling emotion and excitement because I think this is going to be a game with two teams who like to run the football, who aren't in a hurry to snap the ball. There'll be less possessions than probably in a typical Big 12 game. And what that means – is a turnover or two becomes even more valuable, you know, in a game like this. So I think for me, number one is that. I'll just go through them all, then Mason can maybe throw yeah. in one that he thinks is, is different for him. I think they've got to control the line of scrimmage. They don't have to dominate it necessarily. I don't think they have to disown these guys on the, line, on the line of scrimmage. But I think we'll need to look back after the game and say, K-State was clearly better up front on both sides of the ball. And then lastly, they're going to have to find a way to make, you know, chunk plays or big plays or explosives or whatever you want to call them. Because as you know, as Kleiman said, it is hard even against good. And I'm not saying Nichols is a bad team, but even against a bad team, it can be hard to have 12 play drives that you get five yards a chunk and never make a mistake. K State's going to get a, probably a lot of one on one against the receivers. And can a thing like he like Mason talked about when Shabaston Taylor comes in on a second and two and they're running, you know, a play action deep post, can he make that big play for them? They're going to have to do that a few times. I think they will. Yeah. But I think those are the three things that, to me, if you guys have something to add, I'd love to hear. But to me, I'm probably most interested in seeing what happens tomorrow night against Nichols. No, I think that's pretty perfect because pretty perfect. You know what I was going to say? I was just going to three keys. Number one, offense. Number two, <laughs> defense. 
offense <laughs> and number three, special teams. Because you can still score on special teams. Defense, G Mini. Technically, defense, G-Mini. Technically, technically the defense doesn't have to do anything to win the game. You're right. Yeah, if the offense exactly. special teams do And as not. I always say, the yeah. best defense is a good offense. Yep. <laughs> so there yeah. you go. There's your keys. I think you guys covered it. Uh, good. let's let's do top players. Uh, top player to watch. Let's start with base. Let's yeah, with who's, base. A, who's the guy you want to watch? The guy you want to watch. The one guy. It could be a Nichols player, too. Oh, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> uh, well, we, I, the only guy we keep Chase, hearing about is, is 4K. 4K, and you know. <laughs> Still a mystery. Their number one receiver. You know, we, if he's going to play or not, we've kind of dug around. He had some legal problems earlier this month. But anyway, it's K State. Yeah, back yeah. to K State. Hey, you know, it's a tough deal for that guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's a joke, you know. <laughs> hey, uh, at least he has the opportunity. Um, I, in, in reality, I think for K State, I kind of want to be different for you know who I'm going to pick for to be a key guy. So I'm going to go on defense, and and I think that the guy that's going to be play a key role for him is Trey Deshaun. I think it's going to be a little bit different. You know, a lot of guys will probably say Wyatt Hubert, but I think Trey Deshaun's a pretty darn good player. And like you said, they're going to have to win things up front. And he's one of those guys that can really do it. And just busting up the middle and being able to do things for K-State tomorrow is going to be big. So I'm going to go with Trey Deshaun. It's a very good selection. I'm not saying this because he's seated two, like two tables behind me. He can't even hear me. Uh, I'm going to pick Nick Lenners. Not because, I mean, it's not Nick. Casey Lenners, his dad is back there. Um, but I really believe it. I think he was a guy who was set up to have an excellent season last year. I know that's what the, that previous staff believed in him. I know this staff believes in him. He's going to be on the field. I mean, I don't know who's going to play more snaps other than, you know, the quarterback or the starting offensive line than Nick Lenners because he's going to be out there a fullback tied in all over the place. He's going to be so valuable both as a blocker and a receiver. I think you could see a game from him on Saturday night where, you know, four catches for 70 yards and a score, and he's maybe your best lead blocker in the run game. Um, in a game that I think is not going to be super high scoring, I would take Nick Lenners. So. I think he's going to have a fan- <laughs> Exactly. He's going to have a fantastic evening. Um, I think those are two really or good Sam Shields. <laughs> <laughs> I think those are two really good picks. I'm going to go with a guy who I think has the biggest question mark on him, but he's going to be out there for every play. Oh, uh, Skylar can. Thompson. <laughs> <laughs> Daquan Patton, I want to see if, if he can be the the turnaround story of the season where last year obviously struggling with an injury and he struggled throughout the season at a position that's super important can he back up uh, Elijah Sullivan right there starting with him alongside him and be a guy that can really solidify that defense wonderful pick yeah and, and if you remember he was very good in the opener last year too Dick yeah. Patton was yep. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. A healthy version of him, more experience. All, all smart picks, guys. No one did say anything silly like Skylar Thompson. Skylar Thompson. <laughs> we, we, could we have possibly talked less about Case? I mean, I'm fine with it, too. Everyone knows who Skylar Thompson is. But, man, we didn't talk about him very much at all today. I did I did think earlier when we were talking about quarterback how, you know, we kind of said, ah, Skylar. Well, and then it was Thompson. on to, you know, Austin Holcomb. Yeah. It's one of those things where <laughs> nobody ever wants, like, a quarterback battle, yet everybody wants a quarterback battle. Yeah. Right. To the point that we're going to talk right. about the number Although two battle instead of the start. Although it is important and whatnot, right. but all summer long into the fall, it, all people have really cared about is who's the backup quarterback right. in this. They just It's just like – because Bill Snyder had it go on it seemingly every year, yeah. we felt like, we well, we don't have it. We every need to create single this. Yeah. KSO show preview show, we were talking that. We were. Scott, Scott, yeah. Scott, How many other teams in the country are probably thinking right now, do we go with this guy or this guy as our number two? And it's like, K-State, that's the story right Right. Yeah. It's not what they spent 12 <laughs> minutes talking about on their podcast <laughs> instead of mentioning the starter. But, yeah, we, we all think the world of Skylar Thompson uh, – can't wait to see him play, but let's let's pick some let's scores. Do, and and that, you start us off, Dale. Pick us, pick us. This I game. struggle with this. I've got K State thirty-one seventeen, and I don't feel great about mm. it. You know, like especially taking in that Minnesota South Dakota State, and it's just one game. But we've seen it in last year's South Dakota K State game. These games are close so often between good FCS teams, and you know, K State was picked ninth in the Big Twelve. I'm not saying they're a bad FBS team because I don't believe they are. But not an elite one, you know. So like a lot of trends say this will be close. I don't feel great about it. But ultimately, I think the 31-17 because K State's uniquely prepared for this situation by having a staff that came from the FCS. There is zero chance they overlook this team. It's going to come down to who the better team is. I think K State is by two touchdowns. I like K State 31-17. I think I'm going to go with my final score being 27-16. The way and the way I get, I, I'll say 27-13. The way I'll get to that is. I think early on you could see teams maybe trade a score or two and mainly be in field goals, and so that's how you'll get those in there. And then Nichols will get a touchdown at some point. But K-State eventually, I think they're just so, there's so much more talent 
athletically they're better. They're going to wear them down, and later on in the game, they'll get their separation, they'll score some more touchdowns, and that's how it'll end. I might look like the stupid guy because <laughs> you guys are the smart football Analyst uh, six, sixty-seven to zero. You're saying? Oh, uh, <laughs> might as well. I've heard what he's thinking. So I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. forty-one twenty-three cats. I like it. Oh, I would take it. You know, I mean, I do think a lot of scoring for the cats. That I mean, you don't anticipate. A lot of people don't anticipate, but for some reason, I think the healthiest this offense is ever going to be throughout the season. And I mean, against a solid Nichols team, but I think they put up. Some points and that's and they hold that's the weird thing for as okay as we feel about k-state's offense like i don't think anybody envisions them scoring that many points except for flando, except for flando. and so i think that's going to be interesting to see if this offense is ready to go and they're able to take advantage of nickels and score some points then i think 41 23 is a really smart pick Oh, so there you go. I love that praise for Mason. I, I, it wasn't a bad. I remember. I, I remember thinking you were going to say something like forty-eight, fourteen, or something. And I'm like, man, you know. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Um, she was offering more water. Oh. The people listening at home don't know why I said thank you very much. There, so I explain it. But no, that's fine score. You're a fine score score picker. Well, I think this has been a really fun show. It has. Um, I do want to run through our sponsors one last time. You got People State Bank and Legacy Insurance. And still, of course, Tallgrass Tap House, where we're located every Friday night for home games at 6.30. Come here and check us out if you want. Uh, you can sometimes be on the pod even if you want. Uh, Casey Leonard probably won't be on it because he's just going to gush about his kid. I know. But we'd love to have him on. I did it on. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, yeah, and then Bourbon and Baker and Harry's, those two places as well. That's all our sponsors for Mason Both, for Matt Hall. I'm Grant Flanders. Thank you so much for listening to the KSO Show. Don't forget to, uh, I mean, Mason. Yeah, I was going to say, do we still tell our friends? Yes, we do. Well, let's tell them.